When I was in college, I really wanted to grow in my faith. That was the time I said, this is my time to grow, go after Jesus, to really grow. And um, at the time, there was this brand new thing called podcasts. Like nobody even knew what they were, but there was a few churches that were putting up their sermons in audio format online. So I started to listen to some, and, and somehow I got turned on to this preacher at this church that was rapidly growing, and he was gaining popularity, and I started downloading his sermons. And, and in those days, I didn't have a smartphone. I don't think they existed. Maybe they did. Maybe somebody had one. But, but I had to download onto my computer dozens of this person's sermon at a time. I would plug in my iPod, okay, an iPod, not an iPhone. I'd plug it into my computer, put all the sermons on there, and then I had a job delivering Chinese food. So I would drive around Fort Collins, I'd plug in my iPod into my Jeep, and I would drive around, because I went to CSU, go Rams, and I would drive around, yeah, do we got some Ram fans in here? Okay, that's good, okay. Not a buff in here, oh my gosh, sheesh. But I'd drive around and I would listen to this guy's sermon, like, over and over, like, several sermons a day, I'd be listening to this guy. And I, I then started listening to his leadership lectures, and then he had some books come out, I read his books. When he hosted his first conference, I went to the conference. This is someone I looked up to. I learned so much from him, and when I was thinking, hey, someday I'm gonna be a pastor, I would think, what would this pastor do about different situations? It wasn't what would Jesus do, what would he do? I wanna be like him. Well, fast forward a few years, some accusations came out against that pastor, forcing him to resign. And it was a big scandal, it blew up the church, literally the church imploded, and it hurt me too. Because this is someone I had looked up to, I had modeled my leadership and, and being a pastor, I thought I was gonna be like him. And he had such a major fall that it was devastating to me and so many others. Has anybody had an experience like that? I think far too often it happens in our world. If you've been around the Christian church at all for a little while, you know of names like Bill Hybels and Mark Driscoll, Ted Haggard down in Colorado Springs, some big name people, James McDonald in Chicago that have massive falls. It hurts their churches, hurts our Christian witness, hurts us, it's devastating. Or we see in the news, Entire denominations, not only allowing abuse to happen in churches, but then covering it up. There's even a documentary out right, out right now about Hillsong, right? And one of the major scandals that happened there. And we see this in the church world at these leaders, spiritual leaders who we looked up to having massive falls. And it is hard because we want something better, don't we? So this series is all about the perfect church, and it's not us, right? It's not us. We are not a perfect church, but we are saying we're gonna be better. And when we look at leaders like this around the church world, uh, in different ministries, not just pastors, ha having falls, we're saying we've gotta have better leaders. We've gotta have better leaders. So that's what today's message is about. In this series, we're being abundantly clear. If you're looking for the perfect church, it's not us. And if you ever find that perfect church, please don't go, because you will ruin it. I'm just saying that up front. Please don't go. There's no perfect church, right? There's no perfect church, um, but we need to be better. And in this series, in the first week, we talked about, like, some people are like, well, I guess I'm just done with church. I'm leaving it for good. But the problem is we're the church. <laughs> and, and as we learned in week one, well, we're all bricks in the spiritual house that is God. So if you decide I want to leave the church, you've just created a really bad church with one person in it, Okay. It's not any better. <laughs> but instead, we're saying collectively that we're gonna be the bricks that build something better. That was week one in this series. Then last week, we talked about the conflict that can happen between Christians, tensions and even division, and we said, hey, we're gonna do better than that. We're gonna do better, and we're not gonna let our differences, because we have a lot of differences, we're not gonna let our differences divide. We're gonna choose unity and diversity through the love of Jesus Christ. That's what we're choosing here, to do something better. And today, we're gonna talk about imperfect leaders and we're gonna learn how to build better leaders. Build better leaders. That's what we're gonna try to do today. And as a church that we're committed to, that we're gonna build better leaders, because don't we need better leaders? In churches, in our church, we need better leaders. So we're gonna talk about how can we actually do that. 
Now, in preparation for this series, I read all sorts of books, listen to podcasts, um, and, and there's all sorts of theories, and, or you'll see them on social media, or someone will write a blog, like, this is what churches need to do in order, because all these scandals happening with pastors. And, and you'll hear a lot of different solutions that I think are, don't really make any sense. You'll hear solutions that are like, well, it's just because the churches are too big. You guys heard this? Maybe you've thought that. Oh, it's just the megachurch pastors. They, they have thousands of people that come and hear them on a Sunday and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people listening to their podcast. Like nobody can, can handle that. They're just too big. The churches are too big. And that's the reason why leaders fail, the size of the church. But it actually doesn't really make sense because small churches have the same problems. I know that because there's a local pastor I, I know and just recently he was forced to resign because he got arrested for soliciting a prostitute. But you're not going to hear about him because his church is just a couple hundred people. I know lots of small church pastors that have had falls. You just, we just don't hear about it in the news. We only hear about the megachurch pastor because that makes the news. So it's actually not the size of the church, although each one has different problems, whether it's a small church or a huge church. They all have different problems. So the size of the church itself is not the solution to have better leaders. So can we just cross that one off? Some people think that maybe if we just had a better structure in the church, like this, if you have this perfect structure, it's going to make perfect leaders. And I do think structure is an important component that can help have build better leaders, and we'll talk about some of it today. But if you look in, our, in America right now, we have two of the, actually the two largest denominations in our country are both having massive scandals covering up sexual abuse, both of them. And if you look at both these denominations, one is as hierarchical as it comes. As hierarchical as it comes. And they're having a major scandal. And then there's another enormous denomination that has no hierarchy. Each church does whatever they want and nobody's in charge of them. And they're having just as many scandals. So I don't think one structure or the other is going to fix the problem of better leaders. So can we just cross that one off as like this perfect solution? So then some people say, well, I guess it's just pastors. If you're a Christian and you think that I could be up on stage in front of everybody, like you've got a problem, okay? Which maybe is true. But then you look around in our society and it's not just pastors that have failures, is it? There are teachers, principals, congressmen, senators, presidents. We have doctors in our society having just as many scandals. So I don't think it's just people that want to be pastors that are the problem. So what is the solution? I'm glad you asked, okay? What we're gonna do is look at what the Bible says because the Bible talks about these issues with leaders who fail us in the church and how we can build better leaders. So we're gonna look at it. We're not gonna look at every scripture, but there's one passage that I think really talks about this quite a bit. And we're gonna learn four principles from this passage, how we as a church, because we're all in this together. It's not just me up here. How we together can build better leaders. So you guys ready? We're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting in verse 17 today. That's going to be our main passage we're looking at. If you have a Bible, open it up. We have some Bibles in the back if you want a physical copy. If you have your smartphone, use the Bible app, the YouVersion Bible app, and you can find our event. If you want more, search for the Rise Church Denver event. We'll have all the scripture in there. You can take notes and save it right there on your phone. Um, So we're going to read starting in verse 17, but I want to give you these four points that we learn from Paul as he writes to this young pastor, Timothy, who's starting uh, this new church or taking over this new church in Ephesus. And he's writing to Timothy and he's saying, hey, this is what you can do to build better leaders. And the first thing he teaches them is to reward the right things, reward the right things. So we're going to start in verse 17 as we read. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. So Paul begins to focus on the leaders in the church here in this section. He says, what you've got to do is find the ones who are doing it well and reward them. Give them double honor. This, This word is actually what gets translated into like English when we use honorarium. So there's a financial component that we'll talk about in a second. But I believe this concept of honoring leaders who are doing their job well is really important. It's really important to reward the ones who do the right things. I'm not saying reward the ones who have a huge ministry and tens of thousands of people following their social media. Are those the right things? No, we gotta reward the right things. And when we reward the right things, it actually encourages good behavior. That's what Paul says. We've got to give honor 
to those people. This concept of honor is so important, and especially it says for the elders. Now, there are uh, two different types of leadership that are mentioned in the New Testament when it talks about leaders in the church. There's elders and deacons. Um, deacons would be servant le- leaders. And in our church, those are people that run different ministries or lead a community group. We kind of refer to those. We don't use the term deacon, but that's who we think of. But then there's elders, and those are people that have the higher position of leadership in the church who are the shepherds of the church. Now, in Jewish culture, there would have been elders in every town because they were the older, wiser people who had been around, established themselves as leadership, and we could go to them. So there were elders who would kind of run the town politically, but then, now that they're establishing churches, it's like, we still got to find those wise people who can run the church as well. And notice in this passage, Paul kind of mentions that there's three types of elders here. Um, And the first time, because he says the elders who direct the affairs of the church. This means that there are some elders in the church who don't direct the affairs of the church. So we just say that outright. There are some people in our church who have been around, established themselves, proven that they have character and leadership and wisdom, and we respect and honor those people we should. And then there's another group that actually leads the church. So we have some people who have, um, that we're like, we respect them, we learn so much from them. But then there's others that we select to be on our board. So we actually have an elder board, and we call it that. It's a leadership board for our church. And those people are the shepherds overall of the church. They come from this church. I I am the only staff person that's an elder in our church, but we also have several volunteer elders as well. And they're saying, hey, we're gonna help shepherd the church. So that's the second group. The, the, The third group, it says specifically those who preach and teach. So that third group would be people that are a little more focused on on doing like what I do. Um, because I don't know if you guys know this, it takes me like half my week every single week to prepare a sermon for you guys, okay? Half my week is gone every week, okay? So that's why it's like, if you're gonna do that, like we've gotta have like a special designation for those people who are working on staff, basically, at a church. So we'll talk about that in a second, but I do wanna point out that we have some people in our church who serve faithfully as elders. Now, I'm not sure if we have any in this service right now, so I'm gonna put up here on the screen um, our current elder board, So Mike Crowell is our lead elder. He has served on our elder board for six years now, which is pretty impressive. In the fall, he's gonna go off off the board. Our policy is kind of six years, and then you gotta take one year of sabbatical. Like, you need a break, okay? You deserve it, right, (laughs) after six years. So Mike is gonna step down, but then we have Chris Webb, Jeremy Schneider, Mike Salem, and myself on our elder board. And I think Mike Salem is down in Bolivia right now with his um, family. But um, these, these elders are currently the board that governs our church, They shepherd our church. We also have people in our church who have served on the elder board in the past, and we want to honor those people as well. So I want to name some of these names. Some of you guys know these people. Barry Brandt, Jimmy Smith, who's in Mexico right now. Gary Lidholm, who was serving on our safety team this morning. Kinton Chan, who's here right now, but is serving um, overseas uh, most of the time. Um, Steph Staley. I don't know if Steph is here today. I have haven't seen her, as well as um, Greg Buchanan. So um, if you're here and you're a current or former elder, would you please stand up? That might be just Kenton here in the service. Can we give a round of applause? Thank you so much for serving. We want to honor the people who serve. We got to reward them because it's not the funnest job. (laughs) A lot of people look at this and they look at all the scandals and they're like, I don't want anything to do with that. Okay, people are going to look at my life, not just am I a good leader, but but do I have character, moral integrity? Like, that's a high bar. A lot of people are like, no, I don't want anything to do with it. And that's why Paul even says earlier in Timothy, he's like, those who desire to be an elder, it's, it's a, that's a noble task. Like, it's a good desire to someday say, hey, I'd like to be an elder, w- whether you're serving on the board or not. So that, that's the first thing I want to say. We need to give people honor and respect. In, in Hebrews, in the, I'm sorry, in 1 Thessalonians, that's our next verse that we're going to look at. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13, it says, Honor those who are your leaders. Give them honor in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. So we should honor those who serve in those positions of leaders, leadership, especially those who serve as elders. Because when you reward people, even if it's just with respect and honor, you encourage good behavior. Those who serve well, we want to honor them well. And and I think it's really interesting that that passage talks about like love too. Like a lot of people think of their pastors as like, they're the ones who feed me. They're the ones who take care of us. But it also goes the other way, doesn't it? 
you guys as the church take care of me, take care of all our elders, take care of our staff here. You guys take care of us. And we'll talk about finances in just a minute, but what that means is you guys take care of us, and that actually helps us do our job well. I know that a couple weeks ago, when I had to miss a Sunday, um, because Canaan had to be in the hospital twice, we were super sick, a few of you guys found out about it, and someone like Grace Chan brought us a meal. Kyla Bresnahan made us an incredible spaghetti. I love the sauce, thank you, get her recipe, it's good. The Denningtons, who have a baby at home, sent us a gift card so we can get DoorDash. And I'm like, why are they thinking about us? Somebody should be thinking about them. But they're caring for us. And that's just recent. Like, a lot of you have cared for us in the past before. But you guys care for us as the pastor of this church. You care for Sawyer as an associate pastor and our staff and our elders as well. That honor, that respect and caring and loving for your leaders is important if you want them to do a good job. So when you see them doing a good job, encourage them. I love encouragement, okay? If you send me an encouraging email or text, you'll be one of my favorite people. I'm just telling you guys that. I'm trying to reward that behavior (laughs) because I want more of it. Because when you reward the right things, you see more of it happen. And in addition to that, I do think there is a specific instruction here for finances. Paul goes on with that double honor as he, if we look at verse 17 and 18 together, He says, the elders are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain and the worker deserves his wages. So you guys are like, are they calling pastors oxen? Okay. Paul is actually quoting Deuteronomy. He's quoting scripture. And if you don't get this concept, it seems a little weird, but the oxen would have been treading the grain in order to separate you know, the wheat from the chaff, right? The, the oxen would have been like stomping on it to get the grains out. Um, that's what they would have done in those days. They didn't have quarter million dollar combines doing the work for them. Okay, so these oxen are, are working on there. And what they said is like, this was literally in the law, like don't put a muzzle on your oxen. He's walking in the food. Why would you put a muzzle on him and then feed him later? Just let him eat while he's going. In the same way, if your human workers are working, let them eat. <laughs> okay, do you guys get that? And, you know, this is, the argument is like, you're supposed to take care of your animals. It's a biblical concept. Take care of your animals. Take care of your humans even more. That's what Paul is saying. Because in case you didn't know that, humans are more valuable than animals. And I do think I need to say that because in our society, we treat our dogs better than we treat our people. Amen? Right? So we need to treat our workers, our human workers, better than we treat our oxen. Let them eat if they're working. And he says, especially for those who preach or teach, because if they're spending, you know, 20 hours on a sermon, you know, for the week, like, how are they going to keep working a job? Like, it is hard. Paul did it, but Jesus didn't even do it, okay? Paul worked a separate job so that he wouldn't have to be, you know, dependent on somebody's finances, but that wasn't actually normal. Jesus was dependent on other people's financial donations, and that's why the second quotation that Paul gives us that he calls scripture is from Jesus himself, who said, the worker deserves his wages, Jesus said that. Did you know Jesus was completely dependent on other people's financial support? We talked about this when we went through Luke. There was this section where Jesus is preaching, and it says to these groups of women, they were his financial backers. They gave him money so that he could go preach, he could do ministry, and he wouldn't have to worry about those things. And where he slept, like it was whoever's house had an opening for him. Like when, even like the Last Supper, it's like, where can we get a room for free? Like, just like, let's go check, see if somebody will give us a room. Because he was completely dependent on financial support from others. And and so many in the church world are as well. Our staff here is dependent on your financial support. You guys support us. And so if you want us to do a good job, you've got to financially support us. And I do know that I have seen very good ministry leaders, pastors, drop out of ministry because they couldn't financially support their family. I've seen it happen recently a couple times. Like, why would I work so hard to get paid so little when I could go make way more money and work less? But when we as a church say, no, we're going to reward the right things, we're going to financially support our pastors, our staff, it actually allows better leaders to be built because we're not having to worry about those things as much. So that's why he specifically says that, that financial, import, uh, financial support is so important. And so uh, the way our church is set up is that we have a staff 
and then myself as the lead pastor, I'm the only one on the elder board, but the way we do it is the elder board actually determines how much I get paid. So they do that, just like anybody else has an annual performance evaluation, because that's what Paul is saying. There needs to be a performance evaluation. When there's good behavior, you reward it, right? Some people think that the church has like imported all these business ideas. Like, no, 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 it's actually in the Bible. Like, you're supposed to reward the people who do their job well. Reward them, because then they're gonna do an even better job the next time. That's how it works. If people are like, I thought pastors are supposed to be more spiritual than that. Aren't they just supposed to do their job and like it, even if they don't get paid well? Well, I think it was Jesus who said the worker deserves his wages, okay? I'm just gonna say Jesus said that. Let's not be more spiritual than scripture. Rewarding people for good behavior is a good thing. I looked up this quote, um, and, and it said it was from Bradley Cooper, and I don't think that's right. Because I think it all goes all the way back to Plato, the Greek philosopher, not Plato, Plato. But, but it goes something like this, that what gets celebrated gets cultivated. You guys heard that concept before? What gets celebrated gets cultivated. What gets rewarded gets replicated. So when you honor and reward people who are doing a good job, whether it's verbally, whether it's with showing respect or financially rewarding it, it's going to build that good behavior up even more. We try to do this as a staff. You can ask our staff. Every staff meeting Monday, we say, what are our wins this week? What could we celebrate? Because when we celebrate things every week, we're like, ooh, let's try to do more of that. And just this last week, there was a kind of a cool thing. We had, had a young guy uh, come up to me a- after the service and said, hey, I've been coming four times. And I'm like, oh, great. It's a 20-something guy. And I was like, oh, wh- why'd you come? And he's like, well, I talked with Gary Bell. Gary's on our safety team in his 60s. I'm like, why is this 20-year-old guy coming to church with a 60 year Because he's like, yeah, I was looking for a church. And I asked Gary, I said, where do you go to church? And I'm like, that's incredible. Because now that's saying, like, he's living a life that somebody says, I want to go to the church you go to. Don't we want to see more of that? So we celebrated at staff meeting this week. We're like, that's awesome. We want to see more of that, that people are living in a way that everybody's like, I want to go to your church. So I'm telling you guys that so we can see more of that happen, all right? Let's live in a way that people say, hey, I wanna go to that person's church. So I'm telling you guys that we celebrate as a staff, we celebrate as a church, different things, because what you celebrate, you cultivate. And in this sense, what you reward gets repeated. So let's reward the right things. And the right things for Christian leaders are not, look at the huge audience. The football game's got a huge audience, okay? It's not, look at the huge social media following. There's idiots boxing each other that get huge social media followings, okay? It's not about those things. What I would say, like, it it breaks down to two different things, faithfulness and fruitfulness. It's both of these things that we should look for to reward. It's faithfulness. Are you doing your job well? Are you sticking with it even when it's hard? Because sometimes you don't see the fruit that you want to. There are seasons where, like, we're not seeing as many people come to Christ or get baptized. We're not seeing a lot of people turn out. But we keep at it. That's faithfulness. That should be rewarded. But so should fruitfulness. If you go a span of years or a decade without seeing any fruit, like, maybe you're not watering right. Right? Okay, so it's got to be both of those things. And that's why when Paul says, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor. So when we see good behavior, we reward it. You guys with me on this? If we want to build better leaders, we've got to reward the right things. And those right things include character. It includes spiritual maturity. It's not just like, man, he can preach. Let's give him some money. It's like, no, no, no. It's got to be the character and spiritual integrity as well. And that's why Paul next is going to give us our second point that we need to learn. Not only do we need to reward the right things, we need to require accountability. We need to require accountability if we want to have better leaders leading in the church. Require accountability. So Paul turns next and tells Timothy in verse 19, he says, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. Meaning, if there's an elder who's doing something bad, make sure there's evidence that they're actually doing it bad. Because there's a lot of people who try to just accuse and and criticize spiritual leaders. I mean, it happens all the time. But when there's a legitimate criticism with evidence, you know, that's why it says two or three witnesses. Like, if there's evidence, then you do need to look at this because it's not okay for an elder, a spiritual leader, to do something sinful. It's not okay. So we need to require accountability there. And this concept, two or three witnesses, goes back to the Old Testament. Jesus talked about it. And it's something that has made its way into our legal system. Like, it requires more than just one person saying something for some to be 
uh, convicted of a crime. There has to be more evidence. Now, it, it does say in verse 20, the, but those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. And in verse 21, he says this. He says, I charge you. This is very formally, very important. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. He says this, like this is a major charge. God's watching, Jesus is watching, the angel's watching. You better do your job and hold the spiritual leaders accountable. It's important to do it. And he says, do nothing out of favoritism, because I think this is what happens a lot in churches. There's a lot of people on the board or, or close to the ministry who see a lot of bad things happening. But they're like, yeah, but he preaches well. Yeah, but the church is growing. Yeah, but, you know, he buried my dad and officiated our wedding and dedicated my child. I, I don't think we should, should we really hold that person accountable? And then the sin grows and gets worse Boom, the church blows up. That's why he says, don't hold, have favoritism for anybody. We have to hold people accountable to do what's right. To do what's right. No partiality. Now, what I think is going on here, because Paul says two or three witnesses, what I think he's referring back to a lot is what Jesus taught about someone who's sinning. Do you know what Jesus taught about someone who's sinning? It says, if your brother or sister is sinning, you go to that person in private. You speak to them. And if they repent of their sins, like, great, like, we can move on. But if they don't, then you bring two or three witnesses, and you go as a group and say, hey, this is not okay. You can't live like this. And if they still are unrepentant, it says, then bring them to the church. That's what Jesus said. And in this case, it seems like the elder board represents the church. So I think Paul is saying, hey, those first two steps have already happened. And now the two or three witnesses are coming to the board or coming to the church and saying, hey, this thing is still not happening because it says those elders who are sinning. It is in the present tense, meaning it's ongoing. This is not a small sin that has been stopped. This is an ongoing sin or a major sin that's impacting a lot of people. And that's when you do need to give a public reproof because this is a public ministry Therefore, they're going to have to stand in front of the church. And yes, there might be a time where they have to be removed from that position. That's the accountability that's required. In our church, we have an elder board. And literally in their job description, it says to hold the lead pastor accountable. We have that here. So we have some structure to make that happen. We have a group of people who not only look at my job performance, but they look at my life. Am I living with character? Am I doing what's right? And we have to have that accountability. Did you notice what it didn't say? It didn't say rebuke your pastor because you don't like their preaching. <laughs> or I don't like the decision they made. Or I have a different opinion than they do. It doesn't say that, does it? It's when they are sinning. And I say that because there are a lot of times that you disagree with me. And I just want to say this. I think, I think that Nick Saban is right. That if you want to make everyone happy, don't be a leader, sell ice cream, okay? I'm not gonna make you guys happy all the time. You don't rebuke me or hold me accountable because I'm not making you happy because if I preach God's word to you, it will make you unhappy sometimes. You will be convicted by the Holy Spirit. You will hear opinions that you're like, I don't know. I'll, we'll make decisions that you're like, why did you do that? Well, maybe you don't have all the information. So it's not rebuking or holding someone accountable because they're doing something you don't like, it's when they're actually in ongoing sin. That's when they need to be rebuked and maybe removed from their position of leadership. So requiring accountability is an important thing, and we expect that of the leaders in our church. We have high expectation for those who serve on our elder board, who serve on our staff. We also expect certain thing of those who serve in leadership in our church. We expect certain moral qualifications to happen. And what we, we have to do sometimes is have hard conversations with people. And we do this. It seems like on an ongoing basis, there's another hard conversation we need to have. We say, hey, there's something going on in your life that isn't really matching what, what you're saying or, or, or doing on a Sunday morning. Like, how can we work on that? We have to have those conversations. We've even seen some people, I think this is really cool, who come to us and say, hey, I'm living in a way that I shouldn't. I might need to step back from leadership from a time. 
And what's amazing is the goal of that is never to be like, you're not good enough, step down. It's to say, hey, how can we help you grow so that you're at the place where other people can look at your life spiritually and morally? And it's been amazing. We've seen some people who have stepped out on their own, being able to grow, deal with the issue, and come back. We've also seen people that we've had to have the hard conversations with come back. And it's amazing because then they're stronger. And the reason at all for this is not legalism. The reason is because they may have a lot of competency. They may have a ton of talent. But if they don't have the character that can be the foundation for that, they will have a big fall. I think that's what happens around the church world. These incredibly talented speakers and musicians have some of the biggest falls blow up churches because their character didn't match. And so we don't ever want to put somebody in a position where that's going to happen. And that actually leads us to our third point. And our third point is that we need to raise up leaders slowly. We've got to make sure their character and their spiritual maturity is getting there so that when they step into the position, they're able to handle it. And they're not having some hidden sin that if it's found out, it's going to ruin everything that they were just doing. It's, it's, it's really for them. Like We care about them and want to see them ha- have a longevity as, as a ministry leader. So th- this next point, raise them up slowly. Paul says this in verse 22. He says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Do not be hasty. That's a fancy word for fast. Don't be fast. Don't lay hands on someone to pray over them and say, hey, we're you know, putting them in this position of leadership. We're ordaining them as a pastor. We're sitting off as a missionary. Don't do it quickly. And do not share in the sins of others, it says, because if we raise up a leader who falls into massive sin and we raise them up, we're part of the problem. We have some culpability in there. So we as a church try to do this. When we send out someone to be a church planner, we send them out to a church planner assessment and then to get some extra training. When we send out a missionary, we make sure they go through missionary assessment and some training before they're ready to go out. When we have people on our staff that, that move from ministry director and we wanna raise them up to be a pastor in our church, we have a licensing process we do here to make sure not only the competency, but the character matches. Sam Fisher, our worship director, is going through that process right now. You're gonna get to hear him preach pretty soon because being able to teach is one of the qualifications in order to be a pastor. So we're gonna get to hear from him. It's like we want to make sure he's got the character and the competency. We're, we're going to raise him up slowly. For someone to be ordained as a lead pastor in our church, like we have even higher expectations. Because we don't want to raise up people too quickly. That's what leads to those falls. We've got to build better leaders. So raise them up slowly. I do want to say this. Um, you know, it, it's more like brisket than microwaving a hot dog, right? You've got to slow cook this thing, right? You guys got me on this? We don't want hot dogs up here. (laughs) Slow smoked brisket. That's what we want. So I would say this. Every summer we take nominations for our elder board. Like I said, Mike is going to be stepping down in October um, after, you know, six faithful years. And we want to raise up some new elder nominations. So if you know someone in our church, you say, hey, this person meets the biblical qualifications. I look at them and I'm like, wow, they have wisdom. They have leadership. They've proven themselves. Nominate them. You can take out your phone, use this QR code. There's a little form to fill out can pray through some of those scriptures. We have them listed so you can look at them. But if you know someone, you're like, I think this person would make a good elder. Please nominate them. And then our current elder board kind of vets them, and then we put them up for your vote. If you're a church member, your vote in the fall. That's how we we do things here. But right now is this week and next, we're accepting those nominations. So please do that. So raise up leaders slowly, because we want more leaders. We need more leaders. Uh, we, We need way more leaders in our church and in the church worldwide, there is a shortage of church leaders left and right. And that's why we need some of you to even feel the tug and say, well, maybe I need to be a leader in my ministry. Maybe I need to lead a community group. Maybe I need to step in to serve our kids or come up on stage. Maybe I need to be a leader. Maybe I need to be an elder. And if you're like, well, my character doesn't match there. I have some major sin in my life. Well, it's time to grow up, okay? Time to grow up. Maybe you need to say no to a sin, change something about your life so you can get to the place where God needs you to be so you can do the things God's called you to be. Is with me on that? Let's do it. And let's raise up those leaders. We want to give you more opportunities. We have a leadership pipeline and try to provide opportunities for people to grow as leaders here in our church so they can learn more, they can grow more, and they can be ready for whatever God has for them. We need more leaders. We need more leaders. So that's the third thing. Raise up leaders slowly. But man, this fourth point, this might be the most important point today, guys. If you forget everything else, listen to this one. We need to recognize that only Jesus 
is perfect. Recognize only Jesus is perfect. This is so, so important. I want you to read verse 23 with me. This is one of the weird verses in the Bible everybody just skips over, like, what the heck is it talking about? But I think you'll like it. Verse 23 says, stop drinking only water, Paul says to Timothy, and use a little wine. It's a little funny, right? Did you know that was in the Bible? Stop drinking water, drink some wine. This is gonna be somebody's life verse now. Get that tattooed on their arm. But it does say a little wine, okay? It says a little wine. <laughs> he says a, a little wine. Why? Because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. This is interesting. Uh, uh, this may be because the water in Ephesus where Timothy was was so bad, so many bacteria in it that you had to put a little wine in there, it'll kill you. It could be that reason. Could be that they thought it would like help with some of his stomach issues, whatever they were, ulcers, or I don't know what he had, IBS, I don't know. A lot of different theories about this. I'm gonna tell you what I think. I, as I was looking at this, we were like, why is this verse in here as it's talking before and after about leaders? And then I was like, here's this leader, like we're supposed to respect these leaders, hold them accountable, but, but also they got some issues. They're not perfect. <laughs> They got stomach issues, they got health issues, they got physical issues, emotional issues, spiritual issues too. They are not perfect. Even Timothy needs a little wine because he's got stomach problems. And I think this could be physically true. I have a buddy who was a pastor for about seven years and just stepped out of pastoral ministry into a, a normal job. And I talked with him before and after and, be, and before he, he was like, he's like, Matt, I, I'm just anxious. He's like, I, I physically feel ill a lot. I vomit a lot in the mornings. That's what he told me a few months ago. Then he stepped down from his position and he's like, Matt, I feel great. Haven't had any stomach issues anymore. And he's like, and I love my job for the first time in years. Because being a pastor was such a burden physically for his body. And being a leader can have that effect on you. It's, it's a burden, the spiritual burden that he was carrying, this emotional burden, and it has physical effects on us. And for leaders, it's hard to be a leader. So I think Paul is putting this in there to remind us, like, leaders aren't perfect. Jesus is the only one who's perfect. They're weak. Paul goes on in verse 24 to say, the sins of some are obvious. It's very clear this person has sinned. Like, don't make them your pastor reaching the place of judgment ahead of them, like before they get to the judgment seat, like they're, they're gonna, their sin is gonna find them out and they're gonna be taken out of leadership. He says, but the sins of others trail behind them. There are some you think are a great leader, a person of character, and then all of a sudden they have a massive fall. What happened? But it eventually finds them out. In the same way, he says in verse 25, good deeds are obvious and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. We have seen this. It wasn't until after Bill Hybels retired that all the things came out about him that he was doing wrong. It wasn't until after Ravi Zacharias died that it came out all the sin that he was involved in. But it came out. But these people that I've respected, maybe some of you have as well, looked up to, and if you don't know your, their names, that's fine. <laughs> maybe good. But these people we look up to and we're like, wow, eventually their sin comes out. And no matter who the leader is and how great they are and as much as they've accomplished, they're all imperfect. They are all sinners. And guess what? I'm a sinner too. I am an imperfect leader. And if I haven't let you down yet, I will. God willing, I will never have a moral failure, but I know I'm gonna let you down. Like seriously, when new people come and they're like, oh my gosh, your preaching's amazing. I love this church. You're such a great pastor. I'm like, just wait. Like... I'm gonna disappoint you. Can we just get it out of the way and move on? I will make decisions you disagree with. I will do things that you don't like. I will say things that you don't like. I will not say things you wish I would have said. I will say some things, I just said it in the wrong way and that offended you. I'm gonna let you down. Every human leader will let you down. We are imperfect. That's why we look to Jesus, the only perfect leader. Hebrews 12 too teaches us this. It says, let us look only to Jesus, the one who began our faith and who makes it perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. Let's look to him, focus on him. Only he is the one that our faith should be put on. Way too many people have their faith with Jesus Christ based on a human being. 
Jesus is our mediator, not some stupid human being that's gonna mess you up. And I think when we see leaders fall, churches collapse, they were putting way too much faith in a human being. And we can't do that. Look to Jesus and only to Jesus. We've gotta do it. Because we need to build better leaders. And we're committed to that as a church. We're committed to that as a church because we need better leaders. It's, it's hard in ministry. Um, they, they said pre-pandemic that one out of two pastors will drop out within five years and only one out of 20 pastors who start in ministry will retire in ministry. And this is pre-pandemic statistics. There was just a survey that came out and they found out that 43% of pastors right now are seriously considering dropping out of ministry for good. 43%. It's a hard job. People don't want to do it. <laughs> Rather do something. Well, I could be paid way more doing something else. And I know it's true. I had a month earlier this year that four friends of mine who were pastors all dropped out of ministry in the same month. This is a hard season. One of them, I think, is coming back into ministry, but the other three are like, I'm out for good. I'm done. It's difficult. And I know it personally. Back in 2020, I was trying to come up with a list of things I could do outside of ministry. The list wasn't very good. I'm like, what can I do? <laughs> but it was a hard year. Okay, it was a hard year. It was brutal. And I seriously thought about quitting. I'm in a good season now. Like these 43%, that's not me right now. I want you guys to know that. Right now, this job is a joy. You guys as a church make it a joy. But it's hard. And we've got to build better leaders. And for us in this church, I want you to know this. This is not an academic exercise. If you guys don't know this, Back in 2015, my predecessor, our lead pastor here, um, had to resign because of a personal failure. This isn't theoretical for us. This church has dealt with this. I, I just want to see a, a show of hands. Who in here was around in May 2015 when all this happened? Could you raise your hand in the air? Can we give a hand to these people? I mean, because that was a brutal season for our church. It devastated a lot of people. Dozens, if not hundreds of people left this church. Some to go to other churches, but some to drop out of church for good. And it's sad because we need better leaders. So we're committed as a church to build better leaders here. You know, that season for, for the next two years um, and beyond, because I got here in April of 2017 and it was still rocky for a little while, right? Because we, we had to rebuild and there was a lot of, you know, hurt that had happened. There were people that didn't and maybe still don't ever trust a pastor. They're like, I don't like you, Matt, just because you're a pastor because of what happened to them, because of the personal hurt that they experienced. It's hard when the people we look up to that our spiritual leaders fall. So that's why we need to, as a group, this is every single one of us, we need to build better leaders. We've got to reward the right things. We've got to require accountability. We've got to raise up leaders slowly. And we've got to recognize that only Jesus is perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. And let's put our faith in him. So if you're here and you are hurt, because a lot of people are still dealing with hurt from 2015, or you've been hurt by another pastor somewhere else, or, or another ministry leader you looked up to, or someone sent you this message because they know you were hurt. If that's you, God loves you, I'm sorry, and Jesus wants you back. He cares for you, and it's time to find healing. I'm serious, God wants us to be healed. And Jesus is the one who says, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy burdened, and you will find rest. Jesus is the perfect one who can provide you that rest. So if you're struggling and hurting right now, come to Jesus, find the healing you need. I recommend that book, Healing Your Church Hurt. I recommend getting some therapy because the enemy wants you sidelined. and Jesus wants you in the game. It's time to get the healing you need so we can move ahead forward and together we can build better leaders. And if you're here, I wanna encourage you, if you're part of our church and you wanna build something better, let's commit to building better leaders, to be the leaders ourselves, to respect our leaders, to give financially. We're gonna collect our offering right now so that literally we can practice what we preach, okay? Because when we financially support the church, we're saying, hey, we want better. We want the leaders to be rewarded when they do what is done well. So we're gonna have an opportunity to do that and then we're gonna stand and look only to Jesus, the only perfect leader together as we worship him. So would you guys pray with me? 
Lord God, we come to you. Many in this room have been hurt by a spiritual leader who let them down, someone they looked up to who fell. I know it personally. Our church knows it personally. And Lord God, heal us. Heal us. Restore us again. Let us find joy again in the house of the Lord, that we can come together because our faith is in Jesus, the perfect leader, the only perfect human being the perfect son of God who died on the cross, even though he had no sin and done nothing wrong. Lord, we look to him and let our faith be in him and him alone. Let us not look to foolish, sinful man who fails again and again, but may our faith be in Jesus. God, we look to you. Amen. Okay, right now, if, if you do wanna give, in three ways, arisedenver.com slash give. Online, you can text a dollar amount to 84321, or we do have white boxes if you're here in person. You can drop a cash or check. And this is gonna be our worship, responding in obedience to what we've learned today. And then once you've given, please stand up and we'll sing God, I Look to You together.